Welcome to the National Constitution Center. Uh, my name is Tom Donnelly. I'm the new uh, Senior Fellow for Constitutional Studies here at the Center, and this is actually my maiden voyage. It's my first uh, evening town hall program. Absolutely delighted to be here. I, I look forward to getting to know, you know all of you in the, in, the, in the weeks and months ahead as we have more of these events. Um, so please, don't, don't be strangers. Um, I couldn't be more excited about this particular program. It combines you know, really no exaggeration, three of my favorite things in the world, Star Wars, the Constitution, Professor Cass Sunstein. Uh, so, I mean, I think it's going to be a really exciting discussion. Um, just a, a short intro for Professor Sunstein. Uh, he's the Robert Wellmsley University Professor at Harvard, and he also served as Administrator of the White House Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs under President Obama. Um, it's he really is one of the most influential legal scholars in the country, um, a pioneer in the fields of behavioral economics and also constitutional theory. And there was even a, a recent study that showed that he is literally the most cited constitutional law scholar in the country. So we really can't do any better than having him here. And um, anyone who's familiar with his work um, would be able to guess that his terrific new book, The World According to Star Wars, covers a range of eclect eclectic topics. And I just want to uh, tick off some of the ones he describes in his book. He says this book is about the nature of human attachment, whether timing is everything, how to rank the seven Star Wars movies, why Martin Luther King Jr. was a conservative, how boys need their mothers, the workings of the creative imagination, the fall of communism, the Arab Spring, changing understandings of human rights, whether The Force Awakens was a triumph or a disappointment, the limits of human attention, and whether Star Wars really is better than Star Trek. And obviously that... <laughs> That last question is, in particular, is one that's near and dear to my heart, so I, I hope we'll get to grapple with that. Um, but before kicking off our conversation, uh, I just want to let you know there will be a book sale and signing downstairs after the program. Um, and I also ask that you please uh, silence your cell phones at this point. Um, but let's, let, let's kick off the discussion. Uh, thank you so much for being here. And I think, just first, why, why this book? Why Star Wars? Why right now? Well, if you told me two years ago that I'd do a book on Star Wars, I'd say it was more likely that I was pitching in the All-Star game for the Boston Red Sox. <laughs> and while I love baseball and play with my boy, there's kind of no chance that I'd make the majors. <laughs> uh, so what happened was my boy, uh, now seven years old, at the age of five, uh, improbably got hooked on Star Wars. So I got myself intrigued by the question, how did George Lucas come up with these six movies? And the more I learned about the process of his um, developing uh, Luke Skywalker and Leia the sister and Darth Vader the dad, the more it seemed full of mystery and accident and serendipity and surprise. And as I learned that, I thought, that's what constitutional law is like. <laughs> the idea that we would have same-sex marriage being part of constitutional understandings now, such that states are forbidden from stopping it. The idea that we would have a very robust free speech principle of the sort that we now have. The idea that sex discrimination would be invalid under the Equal Protection Clause. These are I am your father moments, and that kind of got me hooked. And from there, I was off to the races. Absolutely. And I mean, I, I, think, I think one of the you know, most interesting and powerful observations in the book is your exploration of these I am your father moments and what they can teach us about you know, good narrative choices and bad narrative choices. Um, if, if you could just talk a little bit about why, I mean, I, I'm a little, bi I'm biased, obviously, and I'm going to you know, this is going to be a tell here, but you know, I, I, I think that the I am your father moment, the real one in Empire Strikes Back is absolutely brilliant. Um, can you talk a little bit about why that one might work and what are some, how, how those sorts of choices, what are bad, ex examples of bad, bad ones? Okay, so I think we're on to something very deep and let's kind of sneak up on it by Star Wars. Uh, if you look at A New Hope, um, the first of the uh, released movies, the idea that Darth Vader was going to be Luke Skywalker's father, that's almost not, almost certainly not part of the original plan. Um, and there were early drafts of what became The Empire Strikes Back in which Luke Skywalker had a father who was a, a ghost and was certainly not Darth Vader. So the, the melding of the father narrative with the Darth Vader narrative occurred quite late. 
I think it was a post A New Hope burst of creative imagination on the part of George Lucas, who thought, I can solve a lot of problems and in a way that induces both incredulity and a sense of, of course, in short order on the part of audiences. Now, if you look at great narratives, uh, Shakespeare, Dickens, uh, your favorite mystery writer or science fiction writer, they have I Am Your Father moments where, you know, uh, uh, Hamlet gives a soliloquy in which he's actually contemplating suicide. That alters the arc of what's happening in a way that makes things very grave, but it also, also fits what, what happened before. Uh, the idea of an I am your father moment, it happens in life, by the way, where you might fall in love with somebody in a way that completely stuns you, but also makes sense. Or you might switch your careers in some radical way. People do. And it's I, I, an I am your father moment. It makes sense of everything, but also when it first happens, you think, oh my God. And that in life, in literature, I think it's true of music also. And we hear those songs which have an I am your father thing all the time when there's some, let's say, a series of notes where you can't believe the musician's going there. And then as, you, as soon as you hear those notes, you think, that's it. And even some of the most popular songs, that's exactly what they do. They create an expectation what happens is wildly inconsistent with what you expected, but it's uh, kind of incalculably beautiful. And Lucas, I agree with you, I think he hit on something extremely brilliant, and that makes it, I think, permissible to say the I am your father moment is a defining feature of uh, art, music, uh, law, politics, it's all around us. And, and it, since we're at the National Constitution Center, can you talk about a couple of these I Am Your Father moments in the course of, of constitutional history? You talk about some of them in the book, but maybe choose one or two that you think are Okay, I'll give you two examples. So uh, in the 1890s, the Supreme Court said by an eight to one vote that racial segregation was perfectly consistent with the Constitution. And that was the widespread understanding. If you said in 1915, that the Supreme Court was gonna strike down racial segregation, that would have seemed like an extremely um, improbable prediction. The law was settled. Brown against Board of Education is a unanimous I am your father moment. And the fact that we take it now as given that racial segregation offends our founding document in a way that, uh, that uh, erases history, that Brown against Board of Education was not an easy one for the court. By the way, the opposing argument was made by John W. Davis, arguably the greatest Supreme Court advocate of the period. Uh, he wept, I think, uh, on the, during the oral argument, talking about the tradition of racial segregation that was built into the culture of the South, and the Supreme Court can't override a whole culture. And when the Supreme Court said unanimously that separate is inherently unequal, that was an I am your father moment. It was a bombshell. And what it did was cast a whole new light on what the Civil War was about. We now think, of course, the Civil War was about racial segregation. Well, there was a long period where, of course, it wasn't about that. It was about something more limited. I'll give you another example, less famous, which is New York Times against Sullivan a hugely important case which basically says that the law of libel is subject to extremely close, close constitutional scrutiny. So if the New York Times or the Washington Post or you say something uh, false and very uh, rough and damaging about a political uh, official or a public figure of any kind, there's a very good chance that the First Amendment is gonna be a shield against any kind of libel action. New York Times against Sullivan is kind of a cornerstone now of our system of freedom of speech. Uh, it's 1964, for a long time before, it was generally agreed that the law of libel could go unimpeded by free speech principles. Now the idea that 
you know, the press gets to say falsehoods about people, and so long as it wasn't knowingly lying or recklessly indifferent to the question of whether the statement was true, it's protected. That's real I am your father stuff. It puts our whole constitutional tradition with respect to freedom of speech in a, in a new light. We take it as part of the fabric of our rights, uh, but in the scheme of things, that's pretty recent. And so, you know, I, I think one, uh, one follow-up question there is, um, you know, if, if say, a, a justice on the Brown Court, they have to make a decision that's part of this line of decisions um, that goes back to the text. Um, that relates to what's happening around in the country. I mean, can you talk a bit, little bit about, from the perspective of the individual justice deciding these big cases, um, you know, how much are they constrained by precedent and text, um, and uh, versus how much creativity did they actually have uh, to translate constitutional law to a new moment? Okay, so let's think of J.J. Abrams, uh, the principal force, so to speak, behind episode seven and analogize him to Justice Kennedy, who's been the swing vote on many of the key cases in recent years, uh, to think about the question of constraint and, uh, and freedom. So J.J. Abrams could not, consistently with what had come before, say that Vader actually was not Luke's father, he was lying. And Actually, Luke was the product of a virgin birth, and he's Jesus Christ. <laughs> that, that would have been crazy defiance of what had come before. He could not easily say, I think, that the empire was actually a force for good, and Emperor Palpatine was quite right, and the rebels were misguided, foolish architects of chaos and disorder. That would undo the entire narrative that was given to Abrams. So he has a, a duty of fidelity to six episodes, which he can't just say that was all a dream and we're back at the beginning of A New Hope and this was all what Luke had in his mind. He's still a farm boy, his aunt and aunt girl still alive. There's no such thing as the force. That'd be crazy stuff. So there's that kind of constraint. but. He could, Abrams, take episode seven in many different directions. It could have been set just a few years after uh, the end of, uh, of the, epi the third episode, Return of the Jedi, and in that it could have been that Luke is, maybe there's another actor playing Luke, he's still pretty young, and there's an effort to reconstitute a republic, and it's, it's doing great. Or he could have done something about Luke falling in love with someone who maybe has sympathy for the Empire. And that would create a kind of narrative tension. There are a bunch of things you could do that would fit the requirement first of fit, and second, making the thing good. Well, that's Justice Kennedy's position also. That's exactly Justice Kennedy's position. Let's suppose we have a case involving the authority to engage in surveillance of the sort that modern technologies make possible. You have a duty of fidelity to the previous episodes, so to speak, which are precedents. And you can't say, you know, the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply to the states, or the president is not subject to the same restrictions that Congress is subject to. That would be very hard to square what, with what could come before. But you have, within the bounds of the precedents, considerable room to maneuver. You have to, I think, make the constitutional order uh, as sensible as you like, or as you can, given the constraints that you're under. Now, notice if you have a theory of constitutional interpretation, that may mean that the best way to make the system as sensible as it can be is to give maximum room for the president and Congress to, to go their own way. Or you might think, the, as Justice Scalia did, the best way to make the constitutional order the best it can be is to tether constitutional law to the original understanding of the document to the extent that you can while respecting precedent. Those are things that you can do. But they are both, you know, let's let the Congress and the President do what they want consistent with the precedent, or let's follow the original understanding consistent with the precedent. They are uh, trying to make the, the unfolding narrative uh, as uh, as consistent with constitutional ideals properly conceived, let's say, 
as it can possibly be made. And that's you know, the legal analogy to what an episode writer is doing in, you know, whether it's uh, uh, Jessica Jones, great Netflix television show, or Breaking Bad, or continuing, let's say, another act of Hamlet. Absolutely, I know that's, that's really interesting. Um, so I mean, I, I, I think really one of the real delights in, in, in reading the book is, you know, you have, you have uh, big ideas like this idea about, um, you know, the construction of good and bad narratives uh, in, in, in various uh, contexts, including constitutional law. But you also have a series of what I would say are just interesting observations about the series, um, uh, about the larger forces at work there. I'd like to just walk through a few of them just to give people a, a, a taste of the book and I, I, I really can't recommend just picking it up uh, the most. You'll, you'll really have a, a lot of fun. Um, one is that you compare uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to Luke Skywalker. Um, and I think what you say is, you know, there's some Luke in him, a bit of Han, and more than a little bit of Obi-Wan. And I want to just unpack that for us a bit. Okay, so, uh, uh, well, uh, Martin Luther King was a, uh, a force for a certain kind of rebellion. So in that sense, he was a Skywalker. Uh, he, though he died tragically young, he had a kind of wisdom in him that marked him as um, a seer, let's say, of what the tradition is best understood as being. Uh, he also had some of the qualities of a rogue. Uh, if you want someone to pilot a ship, um, uh, King probably could pilot a ship. Uh, in terms of his uh, own approach to social change, like Luke Skywalker, he was trying to restore something not to create something entirely new. So he was a conservative rebel who said, if we're wrong, then the Constitution of the United States is wrong. So he was calling on a tradition, not saying you know, we're gonna do something never done. Luke Skywalker, notice, leading a rebellion is going to restore peace and justice to the galaxy. Restore, not create for the first time. And often the most effective rebels uh, sincerely claim that they are trying to make good on an, on an old promissory note rather than pull something out of their own imagination. And how about, how about uh, because we're in Philadelphia, how about Thomas Jefferson as Jedi Knight? Also, also a, a, a subsection and a really, I think, interesting, uh, interesting analysis. Okay, so uh, the amazing play Hamilton uh, is amazing in part because, like this building, it makes people who might seem kind of musty and gray uh, seem vibrant and young and full of commitment and passion. So even, you know, yours truly, I spent a lot of time uh, last decades thinking about Jefferson and Hamilton and Madison. They feel like old people. Don't they? Really old people. Like there's no one alive who's nearly as old as they are. And that's not correct. Uh, they were full of stuff. Even at old ages, they were full of stuff. Jefferson particularly, who as a not at all young person wrote a letter to a friend saying some look at constitutions with sanctimonious reverence, deeming them too sacred to be touched. Uh, I was of that generation. They were very much like the present, but without the experience of the present. Let us not believe that one generation is not as capable as another of taking care of itself. There's fire in those words. There's not ancestor worship. The opposite. Jefferson's trying to counteract ancestor worship. Now, in terms of Jefferson as Jedi Knight, uh, Jefferson was uh, a rebel. He had a rebel's heart. And he said, you know, uh, turbulence is productive of good. It nourishes a general attention to public affairs and keeps, keeps the leaders on their toes. 
So the idea of a you know, radical revolution is not something that Jefferson wanted. But turbulence, rebellion, now and again, that's right. That's what he cherished as a way of keeping citizens as citizens rather than passive recipients of some old thing. So Jefferson was a Jedi. The force was with him. <laughs> um, so I, I, one, one theme of the book um, is, uh, you know, certainly that, that it can be very difficult to predict what sort of idea or work is likely to succeed. And I mean, we can just think of the American Revolution and whether this country was going to succeed, um, whether the point where we had the Articles of Confederation or after the Constitutional Convention and we have this new framework of government. Um, same, obviously, as you talk about in the book, it, it could be said of, of, of Star Wars. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the sort of the inauspicious beginning um, and why it, why it is so difficult to predict what became one of the great cultural phenomena? So uh, Star Wars, which has made over $30 billion to date, that puts it in the vicinity of the middle of the GDPs of nations around the world. Uh, it was not expected that it would do well. Uh, the studio didn't have faith in it. Uh, there was an advertisement around Christmas time and one other, the tra trailers. They basically had a, a very modest campaign. They couldn't get it in many movie theaters. The theaters thought it was going to bomb. They had to work really hard to get it in even a small number. Uh, Harrison Ford, the great star of the movies, or at least one of the great stars, thought it was ridiculous. There was this guy walking around in a, in a dog outfit, this giant dog outfit. That's Chewbacca. <laughs> one of the great cultural figures of our time. Ridiculous. Um, Lucas himself had a little bit of hope. He thought it might make as much money as the ordinary Disney movie, but he didn't think anything like what would happen would happen. He went to Hawaii when it was released, partly didn't want to be on the mainland in case it was a catastrophe. And when it did well, he said to people, you know, these science fiction movies, they can get a get a cult-like following, just wait a couple of weeks. So it was not expected, stunningly not expected. They didn't even print, think it was worth the celluloid on, it, on which it was printed. They printed actually relatively few copies, and with the demand to see it started growing, they didn't have enough celluloid. Right? <laughs> and this is the $30 billion franchise here, the most successful franchise in the history of films. A New Hope adjusted for uh, inflation is next to Gone with the Wind, the most successful movie, box office movie of all time. And Gone with the Wind had a number of years at a much smaller, more movie-focused market. So the mismatch between what was predicted and what happened is unbelievable, really. Now, in terms of why it happened, I'll tell you, I think, this is what's part of it, why it's so, it's so hard to predict. Uh, whether something breaks out, whether it's a tablet, a cell phone, a politician whose middle name is Hussein, a politician who used to be a reality television star, uh, an idea like organic food. Whether something breaks out is often a product of who's talking to whom and exactly when. So we often project inevitability and cultural uh, resonance onto something that does well, but that's uh, either speculative or just wrong. It's that a bunch of people at a certain point in time start really liking the thing, and they talk to other people who talk to other people who talk to other people, and then the thing explodes. Um, there's a, a guy named Rodriguez, a Detroit singer-songwriter, who um, flopped in the early 70s. He made two CD albums now CDs, they were albums, uh, they sold pathetically, and he became a construction worker, Rodriguez. Unbeknownst to him, he was in South Africa, huge. They would say his name with reverence, Rodriguez. What happened to Rodriguez, they would ask. Did he burn himself alive on stage? They had no idea why they didn't hear him anymore. He was a giant in South Africa. It's be, he's very good, by the way, Rodriguez. I recommend his two albums. He's very good. But what happened was, in the US, he didn't get that early kind of echo chamber of enthusiasm, tanked. And in South Africa, he did, 
more popular, bigger than the Beatles probably. And uh, it, it's a kind of natural experiment. There's no place really where Star Wars has been widely released, to my knowledge, where it hasn't done well. But if one guy uh, who marketed it very hard hadn't succeeded in, in getting it into a big theater in Los Angeles, then you know many things in the world would have been different. And you might be hearing a talk right now about Star Trek. <laughs> So one, one, one observation in your book is that, you know, we, we obviously live in divided times and a key mission here at the Constitutional, uh, National Constitution Center is to bring together uh, the best ideas from the left and the right for civil debate. Um, and one observation you make about Star Wars is that, you know, even in these divided times, there's something about it that's you know, bipartisan and all-American, I think you described it. What, how, do, how would you capture sort of the magic of how Star Wars managed to, to unify people across the spectrum? not only across the spectrum, but also across countries. So I was in, so let's talk about international. I was in uh, Taiwan in December 2015, and I had the opportunity to meet with the Constitutional Court, with the then president of the country, and the person who was expected to become president, and she is president. The people in Taiwan, even amongst political differences, they wanted to talk about Star Wars. There was tremendous excitement about the coming Star Wars movie. Uh, I also had a trip to Denmark in the general vicinity, and they learned somehow that I was doing a book about Star Wars. They said, why don't you give a talk in Copenhagen about Star Wars? It has international residents. Uh, Ted Cruz, um, who she doesn't see eye to eye with Hillary Clinton. He doesn't see eye to eye with Hillary Clinton. Yes, we can agree with that. Uh, Senator Cruz um, tweeted, uh, uh, some happy, excited reference to the rebirth of Star Wars in 2015. And uh, uh, Secretary Clinton ended one of the debates, you may remember, saying, may, may the force be with you. So there's a, a unifying quality to it. I think it's right to say that Star Wars has become a bit like a national holiday in the sense that you, you, you can love it. You don't have to love it, free country. Please love it. Still, <laughs> free country. You don't have to love it. But it unifies people across political divides, and we need much more of that. Now, the Constitution has the same feature, but sometimes when the left of center invokes the Constitution, when the right of the center invokes the Constitution, it creates you know, less than positive feelings on the other side. But to invoke the Star, Star Wars, it is a tremendous unifier. You know, I worked for President Obama. Uh, I'm a big fan of President Obama's. In the context of my uh, early stages of my book tour, I had an opportunity, and I'm going to keep doing this as much as uh, I can, to speak to people who you know, have a very different political orientations. And I'll tell you a little story that uh, in one of these talks, uh, there was a guy who came up to me who was kind of one of my hosts. I'd never met him before. I met him very briefly. And, and I said, do you like Star Wars? hoping the answer wouldn't be, I hate Star Wars. And he said, oh, yes. And I said, tell me. And he said, well, I, I had a boy. I have a boy. I have a son who, when he was three years old, had a very serious operation. He was in the hospital. And uh, you know, imagine the lived reality. I have a four-year-old girl of having a child in the hospital having an operation. That's, that's rough. He said, the day I took my child out of the operation, out of the hospital, went right from the hospital to see a new hope together. And he said it with, you know, there was nothing maudlin about it, but it was both joyful and very emotional for him. And he said, would you sign this book over to my son? And I said, does, does your son remember three years old seeing Star Wars with you? And he said, oh, yes, as if it was yesterday. And, you know, this guy, I don't think he likes President Obama so much, but I love him. I mean, I, he didn't quite have me at hello, but he had me at hospital. <laughs> and I love this guy. And, uh, you know, I, if, I'm sure I'll see him again. We formed a connection. And if we talk about the Second Amendment or about, you know, Secretary Clinton, the conversation's going to have a lot of congeniality in it, no matter what he thinks that diverges from what I think. So Star Wars does have, it's, it's a movie, you know, it's not a, a series of movies, it's not a, 
a legal document, but it does have a, uh, it brings people together. I, I, I think that's absolutely right. And one of my first uh, movie going experiences I can remember is sitting with my dad at the local drive-in movie theater watching uh, Return of the Jedi and just being, you know, I had all my Star Wars figurines with me setting up battle sequences. And, but as soon as the theme song played, just being absolutely spellbound. So it really does. Uh, it's certainly your, your dedication to your son at the beginning of the book certainly resonated with me. Yeah, completely dedicated to my son who got me into this. But I'll tell you something also, which is that uh, I have a big daughter. She's not like seven feet tall, but she's in her 20s, as well as a four-year-old daughter and a seven-year-old son. And my daughter sent me a text message um, at, within five minutes of the end of The Force Awakens. And she said, I teared up as soon as the music came on. First time we didn't see it together. And uh, so a salute to my, 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 my big daughter for the connection that she forged with yours truly in part over Star Wars. Well, uh, uh, a hot button follow up question. Uh, what, what did you think of the, the Force Awakens? Loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it. <laughs> Maybe next to the first three episodes and Revenge of the Sith, the fifth best movie of all time. <laughs> Maybe not quite, but I thought, I thought what they managed to do was a uh, melding of the new and the old in a way that was extremely difficult to leave a lot of mysteries on the table uh, to Bruce a new heroine who is great, Ray, she's great, and uh, uh, it's, uh, I think, a splendid achievement. It, it didn't have the kind of originality of Lucas's first three films, nor did it have the, I, I think, the visual wow of those movies, but uh, should have won all the Oscars. <laughs> and who, 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 who's your, who's your, you know, across all episodes, who would you say your favorite character is in the series? Oh, Darth Vader. Yeah. <laughs> Darth Vader steals the show. <laughs> Darth Vader's an icon. And he gets redeemed. He's the dad. He saves his son. There is goodness in him. Darth Vader's the best character in the series. There's a line from uh, William Blake, the great poet, about John Milton, probably the greatest a uh, religious poet in the English language. And it, Blake said roughly, the reason Milton wrote in fetters and chains when speaking of God and heaven and at liberty when speaking of Satan is that he was a true poet and of the devil's party without knowing it. That's quite a line, isn't it? Uh, Blake was stating that view, not, a, not I think as his own full view, but as capturing some part of the truth and Satan kind of steals the show in Paradise Lost because of the demonic energy. And uh, Darth Vader steals the show in, in the, the original trilogy. Now, George Lucas is, I think, in relevant respects, a true poet. He's not of the devil's party. He's an earnest, really good guy. So Vader, he, he has to be redeemed. His uh, evil side can't win and he can't really be killed as, as a bad guy. So it's, it's, he's not of the devil's party, but Darth Vader's the best character in the series so far. Good luck, Kylo Ren. <laughs> um, one thing you mentioned is that you, 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 you say that um, you know, Star Wars is obsessed with the separation of powers. Um, and you know, we, we, we certainly live in times where uh, you know, criticism of executive power has been a major part of American public discourse. But you know, for many years it was criticisms of President Obama. But even now, in recent months, um, you know, concerns about a President Trump uh, criticisms now coming from the left. You obviously you know work in the executive branch. You have uh, you know deeply dove into Star Wars. Is is there anything Star Wars can teach us about separation of powers and executive power? I think so. So the unfairly maligned prequels, whose time has come. It's time to love the prequels. Um, were developed partly with George Lucas's uh, immersion in the history of shifts from self-governing republics to dictatorships. And 
George Lucas was interested in uh, Germany, going from, uh, you know, f in some ways flourishing democracy to Hitler, and also to the experience in France, in Rome. How does that happen? And one of the things he put his finger on, and it does seem prescient now, given some of the things that are happening in, in Europe, certainly, and arguably the United States as well, is that if you have a legislature that is squabbling and unable to act, there can be a national frustration that boils over into support for a tough guy. I think he got the dynamic of that in the prequels extremely well. So there's a scene where Anakin Skywalker says, you know, we elected these people to do the best they can for the public good. They should all get together and do that. And then Padme says, um, and what if they don't? And Anakin says, well, then they must be made to. And that's supposed to be a chilling scene, and I think it succeeds. Uh, even better is when the emperor takes control, the person who became the emperor eventually takes control, he's chancellor, he's being given emergency powers. Padme says, so this is how liberty dies, to thunderous applause. So I put thunderous applause, you'll be proud of my research skills in a moment, prepare yourself. I put thunderous applause and Hitler into Google, and darned if it doesn't come up a fair bit. I put thunderous applause and Putin into Google. Uh, you may remember the former Soviet Union made strong movement in, in the direction of democratic self-government. It's not, not really there under Putin. And there's plenty of thunderous applause for, uh, for Mr. Putin. So this is capturing something. And whatever you think of any particular candidate, uh, Lucas, who, you know, it's a movie and it's not a documentary and it has a stylized cartoonish quality, but he does get at something about the dynamic where a frustrated polity can say, let's just turn it over to the tough guy when a legislature is, is stuck. By the way, in terms of our own constitution, there's some pretty interesting background here. Montesquieu, the one of the authorities behind separation of powers, uh, uh, one of the great thinkers behind separation of powers, said that separation of powers creates a natural state of repose or inaction, which you could see, I'm not sure if Montesquieu intended it this way, but it's plausible to read it that way. That's a compliment. You want a natural state of repose or inaction. The American founders didn't see separation of powers that way. They didn't want repose or inaction. They wanted deliberation and circumspection, but not blockage. Uh, there's, there's something to be written, maybe, about our current period, which would say Montesquieu's revenge, that he kind of had it right. And that does create circumstances that can uh, uh, risk liberty. Well put. Um, so thank you so much for your questions. We'll go through uh, get some of the, the, the questions we've gotten from the audience. Uh, we'll start with this one. Uh, the original movies, uh, four, episodes four, five, and six, have a theme of returning things to how they were uh, before the Empire, make the galaxy great again, if you will. Uh, <laughs> then when we see how it was in the prequels, it wasn't all that much better. Um, that nostalgia erases a lot of negative histories. Um, are we protected under uh, constitutional law from a quick, haphazard return to how things might have been before, um, you know, especially in light of that observation? It's a great question. So, okay, so you can find probably uh, moments in American history that were in important respects better than this one. And that's true under President Bush, President Obama, President Reagan, President Clinton. Now, I qualified this by saying you can find a time before those periods which were better in important respects. They may be periods where the nation seemed less vulnerable to external attacks, say. They may be periods where the unemployment rate was, say, really low, where the GDP growth was super high, where people had a degree of optimism that life would be better for their children than it is for themselves. You can always find that. But it's true that even if a period is worse than some previous period in some respect, 
that period will have warts. So if you have nostalgia, as some people have at some point in recent decades for the 1950s, well, uh, uh, those were periods of sex and race inequality that were uh, uh, you know, extremely oppressive. Uh, if you look for at uh, periods in which Congress was well-functioning in the sense that it was doing a lot of stuff, say under the early years under President Johnson, well, the country was badly broken in many respects under President Johnson, even putting the Vietnam War to one side in the sense that a lot of people are struggling very badly, which is one of the reasons that legislation had a sufficient momentum to get through. And keep in mind that's after what is a kind of body blow to the system. That is an assassination of a president. That's, uh, that's, that's really rough for a nation that is uh, you know, wants to feel essential security for its leadership. So I think what, uh, so it's a great question, what Lucas does depict is that the period pre-emperor, pre-empire, wasn't fantastic. And there's something very precise in it, which is uh, Anakin Skywalker was a slave. So was his mother. So the republic that was re to be restored, that had slavery in it. That's kind of brilliant in terms of screenwriting. So I think Martin Luther King was quite aware of this, though he was a conservative uh, rebel. He was alert to the fact that the arc of history has to bend toward justice. And we're not going back to a perfect past. There hasn't been one. Here's a, here's a, a follow-up question on Martin Luther King. Uh, when you refer to the tradition MLK cited, uh, what are you referring to exactly? Christianity, Marxism, a legal tradition? Um, you know, how does he draw upon, I guess, those different traditions uh, to come up with? Uh, well, not Marxism. Uh, in some respects, at some times, Christianity, of course. That was his faith, and that undergirded much of what he was uh, pleading for, love. Um, but what I'm referring to is, is a constitutional tradition which has in the direct declaration of independence some pretty stirring words about human equality and a, a constitution which uh, outruns in its uh, majesty the particular practices that the people who authored the majestic, the majestic phrases lived with. So I guess what I understand him to be doing, uh, MLK, is, uh, is casting a tradition in, in a light that fits with very general aspirations. And it's fair, I think, enough to the, to the, to the documents that he had to say the aspirations are, are there. He's not shoehorning them in, they are there. Read the Declaration of Independence, read the Constitution. Now, I like to think that what MLK would say is, you know, it's not like we go back to Madison and say he figured it all out. So if we act just as if he's our emperor and do what Madison said, everything's going to be fine. Uh, it's a living tradition. And uh, to meld a little bit of of Jefferson and King and Madison, uh, Jefferson wanted you know, ge future generations to uh, come up with stuff. And, and that is a way of saying maybe that is our tradition, one of self-improvement. I think that's completely fair. Yeah, no, and, and I mean, your reference to the, the words of the Declaration there remind me a bit of how both you and I think George Lucas talk about you know, uh, how in script writing, characters often, you know, take over the story. Um, and, and similarly, in our constitutional tradition, it's often these prophetic words like the Declaration or the Equal Protection, and then it ends up being a prophet like Dr. King Com able to meld it together. Completely. And how this happens is intriguing and varies across things. So uh, some writers, especially of fiction, and Lucas said this, find that their characters are taking over the narrative. They're going in directions that he's not in control of them. And often writers of fiction will say exactly this, that the character writes the story. 
Now, of course, in some respect, that's crazy talk. The character is a creation of the writer and can't write the story. Musicians will sometimes say that they don't know where it came from. Bob Dylan said, I don't know where that stuff came from. Me? Didn't really think that. Blake, to whom we've referred, said very explicitly and kind of beautifully, I, this stuff didn't come from me. Now, what that means exactly is unclear, but for writers often there's some wellspring of something in the head, which is certainly not their conscious planning that produces the thing. Now for social evolution, constitutional evolution, and you know, let's just acknowledge some people are not excited about the idea of constitutional evolution, but it has happened, not through that wellspring of artistic uh, genius or you know, spurts. That's not how it happens. It happens more through some combination of learning, uh, protest, um, restoration, uh, recognition, something like that. But it is uh, an unfolding that nobody planned it. So uh, an important question here. It's, it's a, a three-parter, best movie, worst movie, most underrated movie. Okay, so the most underrated movie is Attack of the Clones. Really good. <laughs> the best movie is The Empire Strikes Back. Phenomenal. Lucas, George Lucas, Lawrence Kasdan, they disagreed on some things. These are uh, titans and they, they produce the best of the movies. Worst movie, there is no worse Star Wars movie. <laughs> the, the least amazing, The Phantom Menace. But not the worst. No, there's no worst. <laughs> and so uh, is, is uh, Star Wars really better than Star Trek? That's a very complicated question. I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> so notice, if you would, that Star Wars has visual um, uh, surprises of the kind that Star Trek doesn't get within a zillion parsecs of. And yes, parsecs are a unit of distance, not a unit of time. So it's visually OMG. Uh, Star, War, Star Trek just isn't. Star Wars has a kind of mythic arc which drew on uh, the tale of a hero with a thousand faces, which Joseph Campbell said is the tale basically of multiple religions and myths, and gave it some spectacular twists. Uh, Star Trek doesn't have anything like that. On the other hand, Star Trek has a kind of literary sensibility at its best, which is, uh, in some respects at least, uh, unmatched in Star Wars. Now, to give you just two examples, there's an episode of Star Trek, which if you don't know, go home and watch it tonight. It doesn't matter if you're up all night and can't find it. Keep looking till you've got it. It's called uh, The Inner Light. It should have won the Emmy. And it's about our hero, Captain Picard. Remember Captain Picard? Uh, going by some probe in his head to some planet where he is married to someone and eventually has kids, learns to play the flute and has a whole life, completely forgets that he was a captain on a starship. He's a person living a life with an amazing family and neighbors and friends. And then he discovers toward the end that the planet's going to be destroyed and him along with it. And then the scientists say, well, we're going to lose our planet, our whole species, but we have a probe going up into outer space, which is going to connect with some person. And that way, our civilization will be remembered. And Picard, having lived a life of about 50 years on the planet, says, he's an old man, says, oh my god, that's me. I'm the recipient of the probe. It's a fantastic episode because it tells you in a nutshell about, for each of us, we have a whole life. Uh, we are, if we're lucky, going to have friends and loved ones. We'll live an arc. Uh, that will be lost, but its preciousness might be preserved somehow. That, it's art. There's nothing in Star Wars like that. 
Okay, so philosophers have a notion of called incommensurability, which means that there's some things that can't be ranked along the same metric, like a, a great friendship, a beautiful beach, a zillion dollars. We like these things in different ways. They can't be ranked. So a very reasonable judgment is Star Wars and Star Trek are incommensurable. They are ranked along different metrics. They're great in different ways and you can't rank them. But Star Wars is better. <laughs> uh, here's another question from the audience. Can you speak to the idea of uh, Qui-Gon Jinn's rebellion against the conservative status quo of the old Jedi Order in reference to interpreting the Constitution as written in stone versus as a living document? Whoa. I know. <laughs> um, okay, I think they're different. So a rebellion against a, a Jedi order is, is really an act of disobedience, which can be principled. Uh, now, there are a couple of different ways to see it. If you see it as, like Martin Luther King's civil disobedience, in the interest of restoration, then it can have a, uh, a backward-looking quality. I think the rebellion you described doesn't have that backward-looking quality. It's just that the Jedi Order's not right. So there the rebellion is, uh, is genuinely disobedient. You can think of Malcolm X was a rebel in, in, in the interest of something that he didn't associate with American traditions. It was something new. And that can be very honorable, but it's not backward-looking. I would say our constitutional, our living constitutionalists uh, are hardly ever rebels in that sense. They claim to be speaking for our tradition, not betraying it. They're, they're not disobedient. So take maybe our most, uh, our Supreme Court Justice who's the, uh, has the most developed account of living constitutionalism, and that's Justice Breyer, who has a, a book called Act of Liberty where he claims that his living constitution is drawing on what the constitution's drafters and the ratifiers actually called for. That is something that wasn't frozen, that sees our experiment in self-government as uh, elaborating itself over time in, in a way that's consistent with new developments. That's not civil disobedience. That's just speaking for one understanding of what the original constitution is. And there are many living constitutionalists, I think all of them basically that I know of, who, who are speaking for an approach to the constitution which isn't disobedient in, by their, their lights. Now if you had a view of constitutional interpretation that is originalist in Justice Scalia's and Justice Thomas's sense, then they are not being faithful. And if maybe they aren't, but at least their self-understanding isn't one of constitutional revision. So uh, in, in, here's another one. In, in, in episode four, um, how is Luke's situation like the colonists at the outset of the American Revolution, if at all? A lot. So the analogy to the American Revolution seems to be pretty close. Uh, the colonists are uh, controlled by an, what they saw as an empire, that is uh, Britain. Uh, they are not self-governing. They're imposed on by various ways. Uh, they are uh, ruled by uh, uh, people who aren't them and who don't care about their freedom in relevant respects. Now, the British have a, a different view of what it was like for the colonies, but that was the American self-understanding. So the idea that you fight kind of, in a way, guerrilla-like to uh, eliminate the oppressive empire, that is what the American Revolution you know, did successfully. And that's what uh, Luke did. Now, one is fiction, and I'm treating it with seriousness as well as with uh, uh, a little mischief. Uh, the other is deadly serious, where the word deadly is earned, because a lot of people died in the American Revolution. But it was to root out uh, uh, oppression in the interest of you know, rule by we the people. Same thing. 
Is there any way to complete the Star Wars narrative where the dark side wins? No good way. <laughs> you could do it, but, uh, okay, so Thomas Hardy, the great English novelist, uh, always had sadness and tragedy in his novels. I was, for at one point, uh, a great Hardy enthusiast, and I found one Hardy uh, story where everything got good, and in the end, I thought, that's really puzzling. Hardy had a happy moment. Yay, Hardy. Maybe he had a great month. Uh, but then I read in a biography of Hardy that he said, I had one story that ended happily. I hated that. My publisher made me do it. Uh, Star Wars is the mirror image of that. It, 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 the dark side can't win. That, that would be disobedient. And uh, George Lucas, I'll tell you my favorite part of my readings. I'll disclose my very favorite part of my zillions of pages of readings. I mentioned that Kasdan and Lucas are giants, and they work together very well, but they disagreed at times. They had an intense disagreement about how to do Return of the Jedi. Uh, Kasdan said, Luke should die, and Leia should take over. And Lucas says, Luke's not going to die. <laughs> And then Kazan said, well, well, someone should die. Someone important should die. And Lucas says, no one important is going to die. And then Kazan said, well, Yoda should die. And Lucas says, Yoda's not going to die. And then Kazan says, you know, George, you're wrong. There has to be some loss of someone you love in order for the audience to have a deeper connection. The loss is what kind of fastens the emotions onto the saga, you have to do that. And Lucas says, I don't like that, and I don't believe that. <laughs> Precious words. Uh, Lucas doesn't like it. He doesn't want it to be. He says, this is a fairy tale. This is the best thing we can do for people. Let them feel uplifted. He doesn't like it, and therefore he doesn't believe it. And I think that's so beautiful. I, I would give him the Nobel Prize for that. I don't, li <laughs> I don't like it, that. I don't believe that. And if the dark side wins, I don't like that, and I don't believe that. <laughs> now, Kasdan, who's become a hero of mine, though I've never met him, uh, I thought this passage I just told you about is known only to like four people, including me, and that Lucas and Kasdan had long forgotten that it's decades ago. Spoiler alert, somebody important dies in The Force Awakens. And Kasdan interviewed very recently, said, I always wanted someone to die. <laughs> And I finally got my wish in The Force Awakens. <laughs> With reverence for the great Kasdan, wrong choice. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Professor Sunstein. This has been a great talk. One thing that I certainly uh, both like and believe in is, is just how fun, terrific, delightful this book is. I thank hope everyone so picks it up. Um, so let's give a great National Constitution Center. Thank you, thank Professor you. Cass Sunstein. Thank you. Thank you.